And joining us now for our international news review, Angela Mancini, partner at Control Risks. Angela, great to have you with us. Good morning. Great to be here. I'm such a fan of the show. It's brilliant, and I'm so glad to be back. Uh, well, and we didn't even pay you to say that. No, and you, and you gave me lettuce, too. Well, we, so I'm all set. We bribed you in lettuce. I don't know if it falls foul of any uh, corruption regulations, I but... Yeah, we paid her in lettuce. I don't know. <laughs> That's Angela, the kind Angela, of show first, we are. Let's start off by saying, what's happening with control risk these days? I think your risk report came out a few months back. Yeah, we do an annual risk map mm. looking at all the risks for business in the in the globe. By way of quick, quick background for listeners that don't know, we're a global risk consultancy, so we work for about 80% of the Fortune 500. So point is, all around the world, a broad group of sectors to look at. So, of course, Asia is a big piece of it. But yeah, we've been really busy, as you can imagine. I know we're going to get in today to issues with U.S.-China tensions, obviously the conflict with Ukraine mm. and Russia, and the invasion, rather. And it's just um, never a dull moment. And I think the, the message we're telling clients, especially those who are calling us in a bit of a panic with some of the things happening around the Asian area, is you just got to plan. you got to have your scenarios in place. Be aware of what your triggers might be, because things are, in terms of business risk, very dependent on what's your sector, what's your footprint. All these risks may not apply to you, yeah. but the ones that do you need to be across. Yeah, fascinating. And let's yeah. start with our first risk yeah. right now, which is U.S. Absolutely. and Taiwan. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh, and you're just back from the States. And interestingly, I think you were, you were talking about um, some of the responses to Nancy Pelosi and the congressional delegation's trip to Taiwan, which of course sparked a whole bunch of other issues in this region, including war games uh, by China, et cetera. What was the response that you were seeing on the other side of the Pacific? Yeah, it was interesting. I was there, as I mentioned, I was actually in California when Nancy Pelosi went, and of course she's you know, from California. So the California coverage was positive, but what was quite interesting was the editorials really pretty much across the spectrum. So you expect it from the Wall Street Journal. A lot of Republicans came out and said, this is the first time we agree with the Democrats that they, you know, that someone went to Taiwan. But it really was across the spectrum that they agreed with this idea of, you know, we need to be strong on China. And as we know, for the past few years, the, the fact of the U.S. wanting to be strong on China has been like the number one, in mm -hmm. fact, maybe only bipartisan thing that people can agree on, right? Mm -hmm. But it's But it's interesting because as you look here, even as you know, you're heavily involved with the American Chamber of Commerce community, of course, the Americans abroad would bring probably a more nuanced yes. a, a view to that. In fact, I was at an event I, I mentioned last night with former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who was in town and presenting at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, his new book um, called An Avoidable War. It was a brilliant discussion with him and, and a few eminent uh, people looking at these issues. And the point is, you know, number one, this impacts other people, other yeah. countries. Yes. <laughs> so if you're a country like Australia or perhaps Singapore, you know, should you have a voice in being able to say, hey, we need to step in and put some guardrails. But he had a great point, which was, can we think about a way to, you remember the old strategic and economic dialogue mm -hmm. back in the, with Hank Paulson, you know, many years ago, can we think about some kind of formal and ongoing framework of discussion to at least try to put a floor under what looks to be you know, a, a U.S.-China relationship deterioration that it doesn't seem to have a floor right now. Yeah. So has very it, different things here than really in the States. ever had a floor, though? I mean, in the last well, 20 years? Well, this is the thing. I mean, it's, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> or maybe even 30 years? It's kind of been on, yeah. I mean, it's been on, I guess you could say, what, like an eroding trajectory. Uh, yeah. But at least in the past, I mean, the kind of the... They were speaking last night about the the break or the, the cessation right now of the links between right. the military Obviously, climate change discussions are off, but the point being, in fact, the, the analogy that um, that uh, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said, which was brilliant, was, you know, it's like two welders in a room with all the wires exposed, water on the floor, <laughs> no rubber-soled shoes, and you're thinking, what could go wrong? Like, right now, there's not a lot of insulation around that relationship yeah. and ways to kind of address if there were, God forbid, an accident or something happens, a miscommunication, how, miscommunication uh, whatever. Mm. how do you address that? That's the concern. Which is yeah. extraordinary because, I mean, for those who don't know, the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, I was living in Australia when he was elected, very pro-Asia, fluent Mandarin speaker, yep. spent many, many years in China. So he knows the, the, the tensions in the region. And I was just a bit surprised to hear you say, Angela, that, yeah, OK, we expect it from the right side or the right leaning media. But to hear that, you know, New York Times and other publications, I won't say tin eared, but maybe we're not quite listening to the concerns from Kevin mm. Rudd, from Singapore, from Taiwan, from the region that firstly, when has US not ever been strong on China? I mean, this is not a new thing. And secondly, 
did they not appreciate or anticipate the, the sort of words and concerns that were coming out from this part of the world? I, I expect not. I mean, I think the Biden administration's in a tough place, right? Because as we know, we've got midterm elections coming up, probably not going to go so well for the Democrats. And I don't think they're, they want to give any ground publicly to any statements that could potentially say, you know, you're not being as strong in China as you could. And of course, President Biden came out and said it was Nancy Pelosi's choice. He, he couldn't really make the decision for her anyways to do that. But I think, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a tough position. Again, it's it's, you know, you kind of can't win at all in the states unless you're seen as being quite strong on China. And and then you can have a discussion about what that means. But not a lot of, at least publicly, uh, acknowledgement or recognition of, of kind of bringing the nuance in. But we we did hear, you know, privately, there are some senior members of the Biden administration who are uh, aware of these kinds of tensions and, and behind the scenes trying to, you know, maybe stabilize things a little mm -hmm. bit. But it's hard because you know, again, the Biden White House can't control what Nancy Pelosi does, yeah. ostensibly. I mean, I'm just curious before we got move on. Kevin Rudd, I have a lot of time for him as an international statesman. Did he give an idea or a trajectory of where he thinks this is going to go? What happens next kind of thing? Uh, not specifically, but the mood was grim. Uh, he did oh. say, you know, he did say he's been looking at China for 40 years. I mean, to your point, he's Mandarin speaker, he's a scholar and the rest of it as well. And he said he's seriously worried. And probably more worried than he's ever been. And again, I think the the, the phrase he used was unmanaged strategic competition. And can we at least get mm. back to managed wow. strategic competition? And so it's yeah, it's concerning. And the business community, which we you know deal with all day every day, is also quite concerning. That is extraordinary because yeah. Kevin Rudd is no hawk. He's not an alarmist. Yeah. He's yeah. a very rational, liberal, sort of centrist kind of politician. To hear that kind of concern and fear from a man like yeah, Kevin and, Rudd and, is and, yeah, and I don't want, again, I don't want to overstate it, but the no, point no. was. The point was, you know, we've seen, you know, swings and roundabouts mm -hmm. in the relationship, but we're at a point now, and again, when you don't have some of the other mechanisms of discussion that you've had in the past, it just gets, you know, out on, in my words, not his, but on quite a thin yeah. limb. Yeah. And so are there things we can do to, you know, rationally to put in place a bit of a structure so you can at least keep the dialogues going yeah. if, again, but, God forbid, something happens? You know, I have to say, as sad as this is, it's not surprising. You know, I've, I've been in Asia for 30 years as a journalist, right? Starting in Japan, Hong Kong, here. And time after time, I, I'm sorry to say my countrymen in the U.S. just are blind to what's actually happening in this region. And, and what's so shocking about it is because there are so many really, really good foreign service men and women Absolutely. at the embassies across the region who are feeding excellent intelligence, excellent information back to Washington, D.C., to the people making policy, to the politicians. And it's like they're deaf, you know, over and over. And again, this has been going on for decades. And when the heck is is there going to be ever be a, a sense of, like you say, nuance to some of these policy decisions that are made? And by policy, I mean decisions to take trips here or visit this leader or, or that leader trade talks and or what are yeah. trade talks and all that. And it's, it's honestly, as an American, it's depressing for me to see that there is so much potential opportunity that is often and repeatedly squandered by, um, by actions mm. that, that I see both Republican and democratic administrations. And it is just sad. And the saddest thing about it is it has impact real world impact on people's lives in this region. Yeah, that's right. right? And again, I mean, the business community Boom. as well, who's also, and frankly, you know, our, our senior people that are, you know, are, we're running the Asian business here, we've been hearing from clients for all over a year suggesting, you know, can you, you know, what we need is some kind of, again, dialogue. Again, think back to that old strategic and economic dialogue that yeah. we had in the past. You know, could we have something like that? So it's not just the politicians, um, I guess to the sides looking at a word, but it, you know, to your point, it impacts citizens, it impacts business community, where investments going, how you plan for, you know, the economy going forward and the rest. Yeah. Which is why not to belabor the point. Mm. I am so staggered that you say, okay, politicians is one thing, but to see this kind of one sided, almost simplistic, you know, stand up to China standpoint coming out in most of the media mm. across the board. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that surprises me because they would also be getting this feedback from business leaders, from uh, diplomats. And the New York Intel. Times has excellent reporters in the, in region, the region understanding so, what's going to, on. To yeah. hear that those yeah. kinds of editorials yeah. coming out on both sides of the political spectrum mm -hmm. in America, to me, is just as alarming of whatever may be happening in China as well. The fact that there's can you not see what's going on? I mean, are you not paying attention to how mm -hmm. this affects Singapore, as you mentioned, Southeast Asia, the South yeah. China Sea? Yeah. 
uh, maritime relations and so on and so on. It's just very surprising to me. Mm, mm. Uh, anyway, okay, so yeah. let's, that brings us to the U.S. and Taiwan are starting formal bilateral trade negotiations yeah. in the fall, coming up, I believe, September. Um, the U.S. trade representative said that um, there is a mandate for this initiative on 21st century trade. First of all, what does that mean for the U.S.-Taiwan relationship? How is it really different from what they've already been doing over the years? Well, from what I understand, of course, you know, as you know, the U.S. has put forth the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is the kind of um, the the next version of the TPP that they that then became the CPTPP, that you know, all the trade agreements that they that they are trying to set up here in Asia. Yeah. And Taiwan, for as we know, was not in that. Yep. Um, this is, from what I understand the a, a way to engage with Taiwan economically that's not part of that I think the challenge here is obviously that can be read quite as is quite a political statement by China and by others there's also the concern of you know if they did if the U.S. does move forward with some kind of trade discussions with Taiwan what does that then mean for the the countries that are in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Is it going to be a better deal for Taiwan if, if it even goes forward? Yeah. But there's been a lot of criticism about the, inter, the IPEF around, you know, well, it's a trade agreement, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't increase market access for countries to get into the U.S. There's really no, um, there's really no uh, enforcement mechanism around it, and there's a lot of criticism. Yeah, it's a bit vague, as, well, as we all right? know. So, yeah. it's, so yeah. that, you know, a lot of Southeast Asian countries might say, hey, the focus should actually be on what you've been talking about for the last year rather than move into this space. But I think, you know, as we said, I was mentioning early before we started, Contreras, um, my co colleague and I uh, did a podcast that just came out yesterday on, on the Pelosi visit in mm -hmm. Taiwan and what that means for business. And I think, you know, the concern is with the Pelosi visit, as we said in that podcast, that was just one issue. That was a, it is not a one-off. That's a shape of things to come. And that was one trigger. This announcement can be seen in a broader context to be perhaps another trigger. We may have something else in a week and something else in two weeks, and we've got the G20 coming up and what might come out of that. But the point is, it's a um, it's not a great time, as we know, in the U.S.-China relationship. And the some of these, as you were just saying, Glenn, the policy moves out of the states can be read by China as just kind of, you know, maybe one more thing that's antagonizing that relationship, regardless of, Neil, to your point, how that's coming across in the states in a political mm. year mm. but it's um it's just kind of one more thing to add to the mix of saying this relationship is not on good footing and yeah. is there a way we can stabilize it and not kind of add add more to yeah. it well, we're going to move on to a second topic yeah. but before yeah. we do uh don pierce in washington leading us with the thought of the moment for this which is it's like traders with benefits rather than a <laughs> trade agreement yeah that's a good way to put it yeah, <laughs> yeah that is a very good way thanks don that's a good one it is a good one i mean i mean it's, it's very apt that you you know you, you're involved with a company called you know control risk i mean you talk about controlling risk i'm looking at this summit the g20 summit in bali in our neck of the woods where we're potentially going to have both the chinese and russian leaders present which i'm, I'm slightly <laughs> and ukraine and yes an invite has gone out to the ukraine whether that happens or not we'll have to see but yes Zelensky has been invited to attend the bali summit what are your thoughts on this? The fact that we have the Chinese leader, the Russian leader, and potentially the Ukrainian leader, where there's a very strong possibility the conflict will still be going. Yeah, oh yeah, a very, very strong possibility. Yeah. In fact, it would be shocking if, if it weren't still going yeah, on. I it think, wasn't, yeah. yeah, I mean, if not, you know, I guess my, my initial reaction to seeing that news yesterday that, that both um, she and Putin were planning to come, as I'm thinking, as, so Contreras does, of course, a lot of geopolitical mm. and integrity type risks, but we also do security risks as well, a lot sure. of crisis planning on kind of tactical security issues. And I think, my gosh, Whoever is having to do the security yes. in Nusa Dua Bali, you know, good luck to you because you know all the all the people coming in the risks there. But I think wow. yeah, yeah. if you take a step back, you know, I lived in Russia in the '90s and during the time when it, if you probably remember, it was a G8, right? So we had the G7 plus Russia, and so I think, wow, 25 years ago, how 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 sad it is that things have deteriorated because it, you know we were at the time, you know, what we expected and hoped out of the Russia relationship with the US and the West was, you know, strong, stronger and stronger cooperation over time. And then of course, Russia got taken out of the, the G8 when they annexed Crimea in 2014. And we see things kind of go down from there. But to answer your question, I think the things there to watch are, um, you know, who does show up? What we believe is that, you know, Putin will show up. He's no reason not to. He's already left Russia since the, um, since the war. He went to Turkey recently, as you know. 
he will want the photo op, you know, no matter who will stand in the photo with him, probably not a lot of folks, but he'll want whatever photo op he can get, show he's not globally isolated. Not a total he is pariah, right? Absolutely. Part of the, you know, have the seat at the wow. table and the rest of it. Xi Jinping will be, just be off the, you know, the Communist Party's 20th Party Congress, so he'll be probably most likely in an um, ascendant position. Mm. Biden has not confirmed that he's going, from what I understand, but it would be surprising if he didn't. If he didn't, yeah. you know, number one, wouldn't want to cede any ground to Putin. And number two, that not only is this going to be the summit of the year, but it's going to be the bilateral of the year, right? We're all looking for a Biden-Xi in-person meeting, which I think would be beneficial on both sides and, and for everyone. I mean, so I feel like they're all going to go. Well, yeah, let's just speculate on those optics for a moment because I, I can't even see a photograph. It's always the photograph, right? I yeah. can't even envision a photograph. In where, the shirts. With the, the, you know, the, the real <laughs> what are they Bali yeah. shirts, yes, <laughs> where, where Putin stands near Biden or, or Xi Jinping. Forget it. Yeah, I mean, How you remember. going to work? Yeah, and you remember the recent G20 finance ministers meeting where Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, and others walked out when the Russians walked in. So I don't know how on earth they're going to do the security. I don't know how they're going to stage manage it. But the expectation is all three of them will go because, again, the, the real issue there is not so much the G20 and kind of what they do or don't agree on. It's going to be the bilaterals. But the other thing I'll say briefly about the G20 is it's a bit bifurcated, right, because the G7 within it, led by, you know, led by the U.S. Uh, and, and, and others, is keen on talking about um, isolation of Putin and possibly uh, Ukrainian reconstruction, right? right. Mm -hmm. The other countries in the broader G20, like Mexico, India, Brazil, they're more interested in post-pandemic economic recovery, right. totally different priorities. And so, you know, I can't imagine there's any kind of really strong joint communique that'll come out of it, but it just kind of speaks to the broader issue of, is the G20 really a mechanism that can be for consensus on global issues or kind of where is all this going. But the real thing to watch, I think, is that bilateral meeting between Biden and Xi, assuming Biden comes. So that's going to be in November. We got plenty of time to watch the uh, and pontificate on, yes. the, <laughs> on the upcoming the security. Things. I mean, I'm just trying to think of your yeah, plan. Exactly. It will make the Trump, uh, you know, North <laughs> yeah, Korean summer right? in Sentosa look like a picnic. Yeah, it was don't don't, to, don't it plan was. for your Bali vacation that week. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's wow. finish off on the Finnish prime minister, Sana Marin. Uh, finally got a drug test to prove that she wasn't on drugs. She said she's never done drugs. After the backlash on social media of her partying with her friends, dancing with her arms in the air, is this a nothing burger? What is this? I think it is. I mean, the first thing I thought about, and you'll remember, Glenn, probably this, and you may too, Neil, from the kind of U.S. political scene years ago, you remember Bill Clinton saying, I didn't inhale. I never inhaled. Right? I thought exactly the same <laughs> right? thing. And then you remember Obama in his book came out and said, when I was in high school, I tried pot and other things as well. And just, you know, just to me speaks to the social change that happens. And I'm not saying, obviously, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying she did drugs and she passed a drug test. Yeah. My point there is simply the change in kind of social norms. And when you think about it, okay, she's about 36. She yep. took office at 34. This is a generation, I have to say slightly younger than me, a generation that you know, it's kind of growing up on social media. And at what point will every prime minister and every head of state have photos on Facebook or some social media platform doing, you know, a shot here, a drink here, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's also interesting because, you know, Boris Johnson, exactly. as you know, and others and have half been of his cabinet, There's right? Been allegations of <laughs> rampant cocaine use in the conservative government. I stress yeah. the word allegations, but that you can find them on any news platform mm. you want. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, in the yeah. case of the case of her, I mean, she's, I mean, I guess the question for, I guess, the citizenry is like, do we allow people to have a personal life or do we not? And is it an issue just because we saw a photo of it? Like, do we expect people to be absolutely dry for their entire years yeah. in office? Yeah. What do we expect? And, and you know, versus what kind of do we just see on, on in, in the press? But I think, you know, I... I um, I think that happens quite a lot more than we know. <laughs> sure. I'd be even more blunt about it, Angela, and say I just thought it was good old-fashioned sexism with a little bit of misogyny thrown in. If it was a young politician, French leaders have been very young in the past. They never got this kind of thing. Boris Johnson never gets this kind of thing apart from, you know, criticism of his god-awful dad dancing. But they yeah. never get the kind of abuse that they're piling on her at the moment. Yeah, but again, I mean, if you take a step back, what's, what's the video? I want to watch the video. It's her dancing and you yeah. know saying that she had some alcohol i mean this is you nothing know, she says you had a few nothing drinks illegal. Out, out it's dancing with a friend story yeah, yeah i agree it's, well it's good for her i mean she's she's been a breath of fresh air to european politics yep. uh, at the time the youngest pm now i think somebody has replaced her as the youngest uh, 
uh, elected PM. Doesn't it make you uh, feel old though? <laughs> For an elected leader, I've been like feeling old for a whole bunch younger. of other reasons. I, yes, mean, I don't need yes, that one. Yes. But anyway, Angela, thank you so much for Brilliant. being with so us today. So great to be here. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Yeah, Angela Mancini, a partner at Control Risk in Singapore, filling in for Steve Oaken. We'll look forward to having Steve back on again next week, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Take care.